Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, that's me, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, will reveal how the world really works. And uh, I think we'll dispense with the happy warrior intro today just for a change and we'll dive right into things although i never stop thinking of you all as happy warriors and i never stop thinking you of you all as powerful good-looking effective focused visionary accomplished human beings and so not surprisingly I think of my listening demographic as the very best of the best, a listening demographic that demands the ultimate from me and forces me to aspire to absolutely the best of which I'm capable in the sphere of uh, broadcasting and podcasts. Have you ever heard people... Um, nod their heads sagely and sanctimoniously as they say, I am an economic conservative. And the reason that they sound so virtuous and noble when saying I am an economic conservative is they think that what they are really saying is that I'm a responsible person I understand economics, and so I'm a conservative when it comes to economics. But at the same time, I'm a sensitive person. I want to mind my own business. I don't want to regulate other people's lives in any way whatsoever. Uh, I'm an economic conservative. Well, the reality of being an economic conservative is, number one, Uh, You're not, really. You may think you are, but you're not. And number two, um, here's what you are really saying. Anyone who regards himself as an economic conservative is really saying, leave my money alone, but I like doing what I like. Um, It's it's really a, it's, it's a form of libertarianism, really. And, um, Whilst if I was suffering from an epidemic of statism, an overwhelming slide down the slippery slope of socialism that America has been experiencing for the last 50 years, um, I probably would very eagerly grasp at the lifeline of libertarianism. But as an ideal system of government, Uh, No, not really. Doesn't really work. And I'm going to explain why. So you've got people who say, I'm an economic conservative. Well, I don't think that that's either wise, nor is it even feasible. But before I explain why that is, why don't we take a quick look at the folks on the other side of the fence who say, I am a moral conservative. And that uh, makes people feel very good saying that because what they think they're saying is, I really care about the poor. I care about the handicapped. I care about immigrants and minorities. I care about all those people who have less than me. I really care. But I am a moral conservative because I believe in the Bible, or whatever it is. But um, in reality, what they really are saying is that um, uh, I might be wanting to come after your money. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I certainly want to leave the possibility open that I'm coming after your money. Um, and uh, and in addition to that, I absolutely do want to tell you how to live your life sexually. That That's really what it is. The reality is that neither of those two areas exist independently of one another. Uh, You cannot say, I am an economic conservative, but I don't care about the other side of things. Neither can you say, I'm a moral conservative, 
because I don't really care about the other side, because they are inextricably bound together. And uh, I think before we go very much further, I need to uh, prove and demonstrate that point, because I'm quite sure that you're saying, what are you talking about? That, you know, people can be conservative morally, but not economically, and they can be conservative economically, but not morally. So sure, they're two completely separate things. And I would like to try and explain uh, why that is very problematic. But uh, before I do that, I need to just make clear that when we use the word moral in the context of this conversation, it really is just a euphemism for sexual. All right, when we say moral, that's really what we're talking about. When people say, oh, I'm an economic conservative, uh, what they really are saying is that I don't really care what you do sexually. This is one of the reasons that if you are a libertarian, homosexual marriage is fine, um, uh, adultery is fine, uh, an utter erosion of any kind of, of sexual self-restraint is fine. Uh, that's what we're talking about. If you say that uh, I am a moral conservative but not an economic conservative, again, what you're speaking about primarily are sexually related issues, things that become public policy questions. And they become public policy questions far more in the United States of America than they do in many other parts of the world. And I know and I'm very grateful for the fact that I have listeners to this show in South America, in South Africa, in uh, Central Africa, uh, in Asia. We've got listeners all over the place. And in America, things are different. If you have visited the United States, then you know. And if you've not yet visited the United States, then you perhaps have not had the experience of, of what it is I'm speaking about. But because such a large proportion of the population are serious about the Bible, the only place where uh, this is higher is possibly Israel. But in America, uh, somewhere around about 50% of the population, maybe 40%, we don't, nobody knows exactly, but it's right up there, uh, is serious about the Bible. And that means that issues like abortion, which gets settled even in Ireland, get settled purely by uh, uh, polling or by voting, in the United States of America, it is seen very much as a, uh, a morality-driven issue. It's not just a simple matter of, oh, well, whatever the, mo whatever the majority of people want is fine with us. Uh, no, there's the recognition that it is morally problematic. But even abortion is, if you like, sexual or an outcome, if you like, of, of sexuality. So I just want to clarify that, uh, almost without exception, when we use the term moral in contradistinction to economic, moral and economic, uh, we really are talking about economic and sexual issues, all the public policy issues that grow out of sexuality. Uh, one of them, for instance, is even the whole question of illegitimacy, right? Uh, you probably all already know that there is now no doubt. Everybody agrees, liberals, conservatives, everybody knows that the most reliable indicator of a path into criminality for a young male is being born illegitimate. Now, we don't use that term any longer, right? 20 years ago or more even, not more than 20 years ago, it was virtually removed from usage because of the idea that it might stigmatize the youngster. And yes, of course, in a way it does. However, the real question to ask is that since we've removed the term illegitimacy from public discourse, certainly in the area of public policy, has the life have the lives of young males born into a to a mother who is not married to their father have has their lot improved 
when we changed the rule and said, you know what, we're no longer calling children born to an unmarried mother illegitimate. We're not doing that anymore. Did we improve their lives? Or was it like removing Confederate statues all around America? Gestures, feel good actions, but of no practical benefit whatsoever. Perhaps even destructive. Why perhaps destructive? Because when you knew your child was going to be called illegitimate, there might have been at least some tiny microscopic morsel of doubt about bringing a child into the world if you're a single woman. You might think to yourself, do I really want to start my child off with that disadvantage? Well, you're still starting your child off with that disadvantage, except it's no longer labeled illegitimacy. And as a result, you feel pretty good about it. The huge number of women giving birth to children when they are not married to the child's father uh, is evidence of the fact that there is very little reluctance left in the society today about bringing a fatherless child into the world. Almost none whatsoever. But uh, there it is. Now, uh, to the question I said I would then address, which is why is it impossible to separate uh, moral and economic or sexual and economic uh, issues in the public policy arena? We will come to that just as soon as I get back. But uh, there is no um, better resource for studying this area in my oeuvre than an audio program called The Gathering Storm, Decoding the Secrets of Noah. And uh, if you go to the website at rabbidaniellappin.com, head over to the store, take a look at The Gathering Storm. Because far from being a historic account or uh, a legendary mythological account, if some of you prefer of a long-ago flood where a man built a boat and saved all the animals. Uh, Other than just being that, it is actually a documentary. Um, It is a defining depiction of how it is that declining morality pulverizes economic stability. That's right. Did you hear what I said? Declining sexual morality destroys economic stability. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to take a good look at that as soon as we come back in just a moment. You hold on right over there. Welcome back to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where your rabbi insists that the more that things change the more we need to depend upon those things that never change. And the interface between economic success and sexual morality is powerful. It's absolutely incontrovertible. And that is partially why the notion of separating economics from sexual morality just doesn't work. The person saying, oh, I'm an economic conservative, but I don't care what people do in their lives. Well, you really ought to because it's going to impact the status of the economy. And uh, you might say, well, I don't really care about economics. I think, you know, the government should take care of everybody, but I strongly believe in sexual morality. Well, Uh, doesn't work either. But instead of jumping too far ahead and um, and, uh, just determining what does or doesn't work, why don't we actually explore it so we can make our way there in a very logical and, uh, and, and persuasive manner? The first thing that I want to acknowledge is that the country as a whole is economically illiterate. You've got to remember that kids get through high school knowing absolutely nothing about money. They don't get it. Uh, 
They have no idea what money is. They have no idea what money is made of, how it comes about, how it's created. They have no idea of simple things such as, hey, the government cannot make money. It can print currency, but if it prints too much currency beyond the amount of money that has actually been invisibly created in the society, then it's going to have inflation. And if it prints too little, it has a different kind of a problem. No, we get through high school today knowing absolutely nothing about... Look, I don't think many high schools today even teach children how to interview for a job. That's how bad it is. Uh, And beyond that, people can go through college in a variety of different disciplines, let alone gender studies or analysis of racial oppression in medieval English literature. (laughs) Forget about it. The idea that somebody was actually going to finish a four-year university degree and actually know something about how the world really works, forget about it. It's, It's a dream. So let's let's take a little look at uh, some aspects of economics, one in particular. And if you don't mind, I'm going to do so through the lens of ancient Jewish wisdom and the Bible. Now, I fully understand that many of my esteemed and appreciated listeners Uh, could care less about the Bible. I I get that and I understand that. But at the very least, what I'm going to be discussing over the next three or four minutes will give you a very good idea of how far away your perception or your opinion of the Bible is from that held by huge numbers of your fellow citizens. And, and it's important to know that. Uh, I gave a speech in Peoria a couple of years ago. It was actually to a, a Jewish synagogue. And um, it, I, I said, look, I've got to tell you that probably 50% of your fellow citizens in the United States of America take the Bible more seriously than you do. Uh, this happened to have been a non-Orthodox synagogue. It was a synagogue of belonging to one of the liberal denominations of American Jews. And, uh, and I said, the odds are that one out of every two people you meet in your business, people who work for you, customers, vendors, are serious Bible-believing be- Americans. Well, people were completely um, dismissive. I mean, you could just tell. And so I said, look, um, let me just give you an example. And just then there was a um, uh, uh, a gentleman, I don't know if he was a caterer or a custodian or a janitor, but he started setting up refreshments at the back of the auditorium. And so I um, uh, called across to him. I said, uh, uh, sir, you know, the gentleman setting up at the back there. And he looked up, he said, uh, am I disturbing you? Do you want me to wait to do this till afterwards? I said, no, 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 not at all. It's just fine. I just want to ask you a quick question, if you don't mind. And uh, he said, sure. I said, what is your name? He said, my name's Ernest. I I said, here's my question. Uh, Do you uh, think or believe that the Bible is the word of God or not? And he said, of course it is. (laughs) And I could just see... And my audience of somewhat liberal American Jews go white. <laughs> and I said to him, so tell me, uh, how often do you study the Bible? He said, uh, I go to Bible class on Sunday and on Wednesday evenings, twice a week, every single week. Been doing this since I became a Christian in 1987. <laughs> okay, so uh, pe- people were flabbergasted. Anyway, so... Uh, I just want to explain that um, the the two the two perceptions of the Bible. One of them is, oh, it's an old book that the ancient Hebrews wrote, and that uh, subsequently became part of the Bible, and whatever. Okay, look, uh, I I've never accepted that. 
the teachers who taught me never accepted it. My children would never accept that. And the reason is because to suggest that the Bible was written by a bunch of Hebrews, you know, 3,000 years ago or two and a half, whenever you want, um, the problem with that is it would require a massive conspiracy, the likes of which has never existed. And what I mean by that is that for the Bible to become so widely accepted, uh, it has to have been accepted from day one, because if it was rejected for being false from day one, then it never ever would have got to the point of being widely accepted. It's not as if it's fantastic literature. Let's be honest about it, right? In in terms of what we think of as literature, um, characters are uh, two-dimensional very often or less. Uh, there are very few women compared to the number of men. Uh, the plots are flimsy. So, no, it's, 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 it's certainly not a book that, that anybody would have written as a great piece of literature. But what is it then? Well, for it to have become accepted, it would have required acceptance from day one, which means that whoever wrote it or whatever team wrote it would have had to come back to their offices or their families or their friends and said, here is a definitive book about the origins of humanity on this planet. And uh, people would have looked at it and they said, well, uh, you know, how, how come nobody knew about this till now? Uh, in other words, if all of these things happen, shouldn't there be a tradition Shouldn't there be some people who, again, just try and think if, you know, if you set about trying to create a book that purported to depict the uh, the real history of the country in which you live, and you show it to people, they say, well, yeah, but there's, there's got to be some, aren't there any people who, who agree or who know what you're saying? And, you know, it'll be dismissed as fiction. Uh, but this wasn't dismissed as fiction because... <laughs> there's a people and there has been a people for thousands of years called the Jewish people um, who celebrate a Passover Seder every year as they have for thousands of years because of a certain event described in the book of Exodus. In other words, in a way, what you could say is that the existence of the Hebrews, the existence of the Jewish people, is a validation for the authenticity of the Bible. It is very difficult to understand why a book of fiction put together by a bunch of primitive editors thousands of years ago should ever have acquired credibility if it described events that nobody else knew anything at all about. And so uh, it's, it's a little bit tough. Anyway, the other way of looking at it is that it is a, uh, a manual. It is a, a set of principles that define how the world really works. Anyway, enough of the theory. Let me give you a very specific example. Until about 1980, um, they say that women earn 60% of what men earned. And back in the late 70s, there were even women's buttons they used to used to wear that had the number 60 on it, uh, meaning 60% of what men earn. And it was, you know, there was the beginning of the feminist protest of uh, discrepancy in earnings. Now, it is true that for every $100 that men in the aggregate earned in 1980, women in the aggregate earn $60. Now, what does in the aggregate mean? Again, I don't think for the sophisticated audience that I am privileged to be speaking to right now, I hardly think I have to tell you that if for any specific job, not qualifications, but for any specific job, um, it was okay or you could get away with paying women 60 or 70 percent of what you'd pay a man and men wouldn't get any jobs the jobs would all go to women and it's, it's not even a question right it's pretty <laughs> straightforward so how do these figures how these figures arrived at and again there is no dispute about this i'm not telling you anything wildly controversial how are these figures arrived at let me tell you that just as soon as we come back the website rabbi daniel lappin.com and the audio program you want to pay attention to is called The Gathering Storm, Decoding the Secrets of Noah. 
And the reason it's so fascinating is because it speaks of how a society's economic and moral declines seem to go hand in hand. So read up more about it at rabbidaniellappin.com. It's called The Gathering Storm, Decoding the Secrets of Noah. You can download it and uh, have it available in minutes for you and your family to explore. It will absolutely change how you think about these topics and will shape you in the inspiration and direction needed to create an arc for yourself and for your family in order to float through the turbulent waters ahead. Back with you in just a moment. How do they compute the 60% figure? I'll tell you right now. Welcome back, you happy warriors, and we move right along with uh, the linkage between economic reality in the real world and as it is depicted in the Bible. Okay, Uh, the 60% uh, myth, and I'm calling it a myth because the way that figure is bandied around is intended to make you think, oh, how ghastly and how unfair. Women earn 60% of what men earned in 1980 and in 2014. In the year 2014, it had only gone up to 78%. Women are now earning only 78% of what men are earning. That's unfair. Let's take a look at how those figures are arrived at. First of all, how do you arrive at the men's earning figure? What you do is... Uh, you um, add up all the income, all the money earned by every man in the United States of America, and you divide it by the number of men. And you end up with with some figure. I don't know what the figure is. It doesn't matter. But it's some figure. Um, You then add up all the money earned by women, divide it by the number of women, and you end up with a figure which is, back in 1980, was about 60% of the figure for men. Well, doesn't that mean that women are being paid less than men? No. No, it means in the aggregate. For instance, if um, let's imagine that more women decide to only work three days a week rather than five days a week, that would then account for it perfectly. But is that true? Well, in some professions it is, and I've discussed this in the past on this show, but uh, we actually know the figures for some professions, including doctors. And uh, overwhelmingly, male doctors work five to six days a week, and many, many, many female doctors work two to three days a week, right? That's their choice. But you understand that the way the figures are calculated, it's not per hour, it's total annual income divided by, earned by all the women in America divided by the number of women. And so it would show the particular female doctor I'm talking about, it would show her as earning much less than a male doctor of, shall we say, the same age and the same specialty. And that's true, but that's because the male doctor is working uh, quite a lot harder, is working more hours a week. And the woman doctor chooses to to right. There's another thing, uh, choice of professions, right? More women choose professions and activities that happen to pay less for a variety of reasons. They choose it, anyways. All right, you you understand this, but um, what happened between 1980 and 2014? Well, I'll tell you that in just a moment. But first of all, let me tell you about something in the Bible. Uh, Book of Leviticus, chapter 27. Uh, The first few verses of chapter 27 speak about the valuation of people. Now, a lot of people assume, again, that this is a primitive discussion about slavery. Not at all. This is not about slavery. This is not primitive at all. This is talking about the relative economic value of men and women in a coherent, functioning economic community. But wait a second, how can you possibly say that uh, women are worth less than men economically? Well, 
I'll tell you, it's very, very, very simple. Let us imagine that uh, you are about to hire somebody for a job that is complicated. It's going to take three to four years. And there are a lot, of, a lot of jobs like this, by the way, where it's going to take three or four years for your new hire to become sufficiently proficient uh, to be worthwhile. And companies do this, right? You pay somebody, you pay them a salary for, for several years while they are getting better and better and better at their job, in spite of the fact that actually they are losing money on that particular employee but the point is it's an investment in the future now i understand this has now been made illegal and or i get all that but let's just look at this absolutely calmly and clinically and economically from the point of view of the employer and the employer has to choose now should he hire this young woman in front of him or this young man in front of him, particularly since he notices an engagement ring on the finger of the young woman. And so now there is every possibility that two and a half or three years into her uh, employment, she's going to fall pregnant. And guess what happens when women fall pregnant? Well, they're going to have babies. And at a certain point, they stop working. They may or may not take uh, leave and then come back. But I will tell you this, that the figures in business, the figures for women who tell their bosses, keep my job, I'm just going to have my baby and I'm going to come back in five weeks, and who never come back is shockingly high. And by the way, I have no trouble understanding this because no woman, or man for that matter, can ever predict in advance the emotionally overwhelming sensation he's going to experience upon holding his baby for the first time or her baby and she's going to hold that baby and her heart is going to overflow with love and she's going to feel an irresistible attraction and the thought of leaving that baby with a with a daycare or wherever you leave babies and heading back to work it's she's going to be weeping and she does and they do so I totally get that. I'm not, I'm not arguing that. What I'm looking at it from the point of the employer, um, the fact is that the woman is very much likely, more likely than the man, to have more, more time off. So the guy is going to reach a point of economic viability, of being worth his salary, much quicker than the woman is. So there you have just one little example of ways in which the economic value of women. Now, there may be women who are not having babies or have had babies, but fine, everybody's different, of course. But the only person who can really make that assessment is the employer. But if you're going to look at the average of millions of people around the country, you'd be insane not to recognize that there is a difference. Um, what are these differences due to? Well, we've discussed it. Number one, occupational segregation. Right? Um, if the, you know, there's a high-paying job um, working on scaffolding, building new oil refineries. Right? You're not going to see a lot of women doing it. It pays a lot of money. You're still not going to see a lot of women doing it. You just aren't. Um, there are other jobs that require many, many years of preparation in, in you know, medicine is, is one example. Now, it's true there are a lot of women going into medicine, but a lot of them work part-time after they become doctors. That's also true. There again, that changes the economic consequences of it. So, um, occupational segregation is, is one thing. Now, I understand what the left says. The left says, well, women are forced into this kind of choice. Women are made to think they cannot be software engineers. They cannot be. And so they go to become kindergarten teachers. But if they could only... Okay, I, don't just, I just don't believe that's true. In this day and age, I, I really do believe that um, <laughs> women are absolutely confident that they can go anywhere or do whatever they like. I don't think there's the slightest doubt about that. But uh, anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's what the left says. The bottom line is, my belief is that it is free will choice. Voluntarily, women make lifestyle choices. 
that take into account other things than money, whereas men usually make lifestyle choices that are focused more directly on the uh, economic uh, value and cost. Um, then there's another thing they say, and that is, they say, well, even right out of college, men and women have unequal pay. So they're both qualifying, they're both graduates from college, and they have different pay. And the answer to that is you're absolutely right. One of the reasons is men are much less risk averse than women. Uh, extreme sports are usually done by men, not by women, right? Women can do it. Nobody's stopping women putting on a flying suit and jumping off cliffs. Nobody stops women from doing it. Nobody stops women from base jumping, jumping off buildings or high antenna structures. No, women can do it as much as men. It's just they choose not to. Men are more uh, risk-seeking creatures, and while it is true what the, the left says, you see, uh, women get out of college with degrees in, uh, in software, in, uh, in, in coding, and men get out of college with those degrees. But again, when you add up all the men and add up all their money and divide it by the number of men, add up all the women, divide it by the number of women, uh, the end result is men out to own women. You see, even right out of college, so even in the same occupation, the same qualification, uh, that's also true. There's a big difference, though, and that is employers don't hire people just because of their qualification or because of their degree. They hire them for what they can do for them. That's why you hire somebody. What? How can that person improve my company, my business, my life? That's why you hire somebody. And again, there's a very big difference. Men will very often go into occupations where uh, there's a big upside and a big downside. Uh, men will go into occupations where um, they may have a software degree, but they'll also be engaged in commission sales. Most women are less comfortable with that. And so, yes, it is perfectly possible that men and women come out with the same degree and there's an earning difference because there is a voluntary lifestyle difference. Uh, women would rather, many women, majority of women would rather say, you know what, I'd like to just know that I'm getting X dollars a month and that's good for me. I, 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 I don't want to earn the potential of getting much more as well as much less. Whereas many men will be drawn to that kind of situation. So obviously, in exactly the same way as two doctors can graduate medical school, a man and a woman, and, um, and the man earns more than the woman in the first six months on the job. Why? Because the man is working five and a half day or six days a week and the woman is working three days a week. Perfectly simple, perfectly straightforward. Um, then the other thing they say, well, it's not fair. There is a motherhood penalty. I just was talking about that a few minutes ago. Of course, there's a motherhood penalty. Uh, there's no question about it, obviously. How, who would you expect to bear the cost of that? The employer? I mean, it's insane. And again, economic illiteracy in the country makes people think that there's limitless money in the, in the till of the employer. Limitless money in the bank account of the employer. Let the companies pay for it. And nobody understands that the only way that can all work is if that's all passed on to the customer, whoever that is, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are some, yes, there is a motherhood penalty, obviously. I mean, how, how can you possibly expect a, uh, a, a, a boss or a, a, an employer to completely ignore the fact that you are going to basically be off the job for three months, four months, five months, six months? How, what's supposed to happen? So, yes, obviously there's a motherhood penalty. That's what we've been talking about all these years. I've been saying, guess what? Men and women are different. And you want to know something even more unfair. Not only is there a motherhood penalty, but there is a fatherhood bump. On average, men seem to earn a bit more with each child they have. And again, that's something I can explain. I bet you can too. That's not a very hard thing to understand. And... Um, uh, and so, um, 
very often, again, looking looking at the average, this is every woman, every woman in the workplace, every woman, you add up all the money they earn, divided by the number of women, you get the figure that women make compared to men. Uh, there's a, a very large number of women who leave the workforce to raise children for a few years. Uh, the average is five years. Uh, for many, it's less. For many, it's more. The average is five years. Now, look, um, can you explain to me how could any rational person think that uh, you can walk back into a job after you've been away for five years and earn the same as the guy who's been there all the time? Just think of sales. The guy has been building up his book. He's been building up his customer base. He's been building up his relationships. He hasn't stopped working the woman has been gone for five years. She comes back. Obviously, she takes a financial hit. It was her choice to go off and leave the workforce for five years. And God bless her for doing it. I'm pleased she did. But yes, when Leviticus says, as it does, interestingly enough, that the value of a man is 50 pieces of silver, Leviticus chapter 27, and the value of of a woman is 30 pieces of silver. Do you get that ratio? 50, 30, right? Double, double them both. You get 160, 100 or 60. In other words, a woman's value is 60% of a man's value in the economy, in the marketplace. I don't really have to spend time issuing caveats. Do I say no in, in the real world? Of course, women are worth what well, you understand, right? As the husband of one exemplary woman and the father of six others, uh, all right, we're not talking about ultimate value. We're talking about economic value. And, uh, and that is exactly right. So how did it go if, if all of these things are realities and that the probably the correct figure, not for any one woman, I'm not saying any one woman should earn 60% of what a very, uh, a guy doing the identical job should earn. Obviously not, that's stupid. But the idea that across an economy, Women, on average, make 60% of what men make uh, on, a, uh, on average. Yeah, absolutely. Just as the book of Leviticus says, 30 to 50 is a 60% ratio. If that's the case, and it was always the case all the way up to 1980, what happened to bring it up in, uh, to 78% in 2014? Uh, well, laws, government, uh, government rules and laws and regulations and um, social pressure on various levels. Um, companies, and this is true now, I spoke to uh, uh, somebody hiring for a very large company. It's a name you definitely recognize. And he says that uh, he has to hire four people. This is what he told me at an event just recently. He's got to hire four people in his department uh, within the next 60 days. And he says he wouldn't dream of hiring anybody but a woman. He says it's not worth his while. Everything is being watched and scrutinized carefully, and he has to hire a woman, in spite of the fact that the company will actually be losing a little bit. Why? Because on average, women take more time off than men do. Simple. Women okay, fine, you get you get the idea. But he said the pressure is so high that he runs the risk of career damage if he doesn't hire women. Everybody throughout this company is busy counting heads or maybe breasts. Uh, they're counting how many males, how many females, and that is exactly why those figures change. Okay, quick break. Uh, RabbiDanielLappin.com is the uh, is, is the website, RabbiDanielLappin.com. And the resource I want you to read up about is The Gathering Storm, Decoding the Secrets of Noah. Because I do believe that we are in a gathering storm. I believe this country got respite on November the 8th, 2016. But um, it's far from out of the turbulence. I think there are still maelstroms swirling around the foundations of our culture. And I think we're a long way from out of the storm. The gathering storm is a, uh, a an analysis of what we can do and what we can and should understand from the story of Noah in the context of where we are now. Rabbi Daniel Lappin.com, back with you in just a moment. Okay, happy warriors. Uh, here we are back again. And uh, 
Yes, you see, there is a reality of a sexual difference between men and women, and guess what? It has an economic impact as well. Of course it does. And there are many other areas in which the interaction between sex and money is so strong that uh, failure to acknowledge it condemns you to a, a blindness to reality. Um, on a personal level and a societal level, it's true in both. On a personal level, we do know that married men out-earn single men. The poorest people in America are single males, of any color, by the way. Um, single black women out-earn single black men. Excuse me, single, that, that is for sure. But they also out-earn single white men. For those people who thought that poverty is a color, skin color issue, I've got news for you. It isn't. It's a marital status issue. And uh, women are less harmed by singleness than men are. One of the proofs of that, by the way, is that uh, statistically, um, men do far worse alone than women do. In other words, when you factor out for similar ages, uh, women who lose their husbands go on to live for many, many years. And Southeast Florida, which is absolutely filled with widows, is, um, is, is proof of that. They're also widowers, but in general, factor for, for similar ages, and men who lose their wives do not do nearly as well as women who lose their husbands. Uh, single women who never been married, single women, function very well. They academically, they are they are taking over at the universities. They are doing very well in jobs. Single males, the worst performing in every category of either skin color, doesn't make any difference. Singleness is a big poverty factor. Married men out-earn single men hugely. That is one instance of where somebody with a functioning sex life seems to perform magically better on the money level. What's the connection? But it's there. You cannot get away from it. Um, there, is also, uh, there is also the area of uh, involuntary celibacy. Right. There are guys who just don't have women in their lives. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. In Asia, one of the reasons is that a selective uh, process has been in place for several decades, such that many countries now, including uh, China most particularly, but also India, have uh, imbalances of millions of marriageable age young men for whom there are no women in that age cohort. They're just not there. So it's hugely problematic because men who are involuntary celibate uh, tend to not perform either economically or socially. They don't do well. Um, a little while back, uh, there was a story that made the news. It made the news because it's really very rare indeed, and that is of a couple upstate New York who had to evict their 30-something-year-old son who was a layabout and had no job, no, no nothing. He had fathered a child out of wedlock, but um, no relationship, no nothing. That, I'm afraid, is, is the situation. And... Uh, Guys who have no contact with women do not do well financially. Right? It's they just don't. It's it's not a healthy situation. Um, I'm not going to go into all the reasons for that. I'm not going to go into the similarities of creativity. Uh, I'm not going to go into now uh, what being with a woman does to a man. The extent to which a man's ego is a direct function of the relationship he has with a woman. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the relationship of ego to earning power in men. All of these things are, are important and real and true, and um, they are in my book, but uh, they are, but, but not for today. Uh, men who have children 
find an earning boost. Again, why? Motivation. It is hard going to work on Monday morning. It just is. And it's hard getting up and being on time for work every single day. But you know what? If on your way out of the house, uh, even though it's still dark outside and you're on your way to work and you stop in in your kid's room and you can look at that sweet child sleeping without a worry in the world, you head off to work with a different spring in your step, completely different. So uh, on an individual level, uh, it is impossible to separate uh, sex life from financial and monetary life. Um, on a societal level, uh, it's also impossible to separate. For instance, one of the things we know is that uh, it requires enormous self-discipline to make money. It really requires drive and ambition and self-discipline. Well, one of the ways of eroding your self-disciplined muscle is by sexual indulgence. <laughs> I mean, this, to some people, this stuff's going to sound primitive and weird and, and religious, but it's really very simple and very straightforward. Uh, we have a spiritual muscle, all of us. It's our, self, it's our self-discipline. It's our ability to postpone gratification. It's our ability to do what our head tells us to do instead of what our heart tells us to do. And our economic success is contingent on the strength and health of that particular spiritual muscle. Sexual indulgence weakens it and corrodes it. The, the more somebody views, particularly men, Sex as just a, a spinal, an itch in the spinal column that needs to be uh, alleviated, uh, the less successful he is going to be financially. Uh, we've spoken about in the past that no non monogamous society has ever built up a successful economy. Never happened. Um, another thing that happens in a society with bad attitudes towards sex is that we stop having children. When, uh, when the separation between sex and procreation, nobody's saying that that's the main purpose of sex. God created a sexual relationship between a man and a woman to build connection and in order to f make us realize that bringing joy to another human being is the best thing we can do. Well, do you know a better definition of customer service? You see the connection. It's inescapable. You just can't get away from it. And, uh, and at any rate, one of the things that does happen, though, in a society that makes sexual indulgence its be-all and its end-all, not surprisingly, it doesn't take long before the fertility rate drops in that society. Okay, And sure enough, we notice that countries that become less and less religious because it so happens that uh, sex is so powerful that only an equally powerful force can regulate it in any way, and that is religion. That's all. And so uh, if you strip away religion, you look at what's happened to Europe since World War II, and you look at what's happened to America since 1962, what you notice is secularization, um, the unloosening of any bonds on sexuality and a drop in fertility. Well, I've discussed in the past on this show what happens to a society that loses population. And one of the ways, I mean, again, many of the uh, governments in, in Europe know enough economics to realize that their drop in fertility is is terribly serious. And one of the ways they've tried to solve it is by immigration. That's a really, really, really bad idea because it's not a case of just having children. If all of a sudden the fertility rate of France, Germany, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Italy uh, was boosted high by local right local not immigrants just women having lots of children whom with lots of different men whom they don't take care of and who are raised uh, to become predators rather than productive citizens uh, you haven't solved the problem it's not just having more people it's the kind of people you have and in the same way that children that grow up with no 
parental rearing with no self-discipline, with no ambition, with no focus, with no self-restraint. Uh, children like that are a drag on an economy. They're not an asset. And so it is that uh, in many cases, immigrants, not all, but in many cases, immigrants are a drag on the economy. They're not an asset to the economy. And so, uh, uh, look, this is a really important point. We've got to understand sex is a bond that holds society together, right? It does. You can't dispute that. But at the same time, it's also the force that blows it apart. What am I talking about? Because if sexuality is properly managed by the rules and the rituals and the restraints of religion, then that sexuality produces lasting marriages and stable families. It produces children who have vigilant parents. And it is the, res and it is the cause of handing down from generation to generation the entire accumulated store of social capital. But if sexuality is mismanaged, or perhaps I should say not managed at all, it becomes a tool of casual encounters, jealousies, aggressions, which produce no lasting commitment and certainly no sacrifices on behalf of any children that are born. And the huge number of children, males particularly, who never knew their fathers and are now in jail, should be enough proof for everybody. But the truth is that the left would rather have this catalog of social calamity than have religion, which would be one of the most reliable ways of solving it. And so what society does is strip away all religious restriction and restraint, and uh, they leave sexual behavior to everyone's individual choice. Because once we've sort of taken away any stigma attached to misbehavior sexually, everything's fine, right? And I mean, there, there is no raised eyebrow. And if you do raise an eyebrow, you're an old fuddy-duddy. And, um, and so we strip away all the morality about sexuality. And, um, and e what used to be thought of and understood as authentic human erotic love now just becomes animal lust. And, uh, and there we are. And this is exactly what happens because we've produced a society by, by the stripping away of faith particularly Judeo-Christian faith I'm speaking of, um, sexual release is now uh, available to anyone from anyone without any penalty of guilt or shame, nothing at all. And, um, and so now everything's changed because once upon a time, we used to, when I say once upon a time, I mean up till 1962, um, these sexual feelings came along with a sense of responsibility. And so moral character included how you behaved sexually. And it wasn't, it wasn't because we had laws, right? Uh, the, the laws about adultery were stripped away a long time ago. The laws about sex outside of marriage stripped away a long time ago. No, up till 1962, people's sense of character, our, our morality, was inclusive of how we behaved sexually. And so um, it, it was very, very good. First of all, by the way, it let women be safe because sexual advances in those days were aimed at being the first steps towards love and commitment. Do I sound very old-fashioned when I speak like this? When, when uh, you know, up until as I say, up until 1960, uh, if if a boy and a girl went on a date, it was seen as a first step towards love and commitment and marriage. Today, a sexual advance is uh, is a smash and grab raid. 
Really, it's a smash and grab raid aimed at the goods in the window. That's all. Look, uh, this is this is where we are, and all of this is very very serious. If for no other reason than we have to understand that the economic impact of sexual mismanagement is very real, both on our own lives as individuals and on our lives as a nation, as a society, as an economy. And so uh, one of the things that uh, I would recommend is that uh, parents, uh, youth pastors, anybody who is serious about helping young people step onto the escalator of life, and is frightened about addressing the sexual area for fear of appearing old-fashioned and primitive, um, treat it from the economic area, right? Young people understand the need to be able to make money and to function in a thriving economy. Let them understand the role that sexual mismanagement plays in pulverizing the hopes of any such kind of financial success. That's as far as we are going for right now, my friends. Um, Actually, you know what? It isn't. I've got to tell you one more thing. So why don't we we come back in just a moment? Because I've got to go back and tell you about uh, the very first place in the Bible where we see economic and, um, and, and sexual areas coming together. Let me do that in just a few moments, coming right back. Well, as I promised, me, your rabbi, one further little insight on this topic. Uh, The first case in the Bible where we are introduced uh, to this relationship between sex and economics. Okay, so during the, the first few chapters of Genesis, Uh, We're introduced to a lot of names, right? We start off with uh, Adam and Eve, and then there's Cain and Abel. And Cain um, has a uh, a line of descendants, and uh, Abel dies without any children. Then Adam and Eve have another son called Seth, and he has a line of descendants who end up with Noah. And, uh, and then Noah has a line of descendants that ends up with Abraham. So that sort of takes us through the first 20 generations of the Bible. And those are all different, unique names. But there is an exception. And the exception is that in the line of uh, Cain, Cain had a, uh, a child, and his name was Hanoch. And Hanoch had a child called Erod, and Erod had a child called Mehuyael, etc., etc. And then uh, finally, there was somebody called Lemech. And uh, I, I'm pronouncing it with the Hebrew pronunciation with a ch at the end, like at the end of the uh, composer Johann Sebastian Bach, Lemech, uh, same sound. And this Lemech is the first guy he's told, we're told of, who took two wives. One was called Ada, and the other was called Sila. And what was the reason that he took two wives? Well, because the original concept, God's plan, is that we should find sexual delight and eternity and immortality in the same woman. In other words, the building of a family based on that sexual bond between man and wife and the children that they raise. But um, one of the most seductive and at the same time one of the most destructive aspects of sexuality are thinking that uh, there are some women that are good just for sex, and then there are other women to marry and take home to mom. This is very common. It's widespread. It's incredibly destructive and, to a large extent, responsible for the incredible decline that we feel and, f- and, and face in America, uh, actually, in, in many other parts of the world as well. But 
Lemech takes two wives, and ancient Jewish wisdom pops right in and explains, why do you think he took two wives? Guess! Duh! That's not hard to figure out. He took two wives, one for immortality and one for sex. He wanted one wife who would not um, acquire any stretch marks, and he would never let her have children. And there are even very interesting ancient um, recipes for birth control that Lemech used uh, to make sure that one of his wives would never have children, whereas the other one would give him children. And, um, well, guess what? Uh, things didn't work out <laughs> quite so well for him because, as it turned out, um, the uh, that both of his wives actually ended up having a child. But anyways, um, then we are discover we discover something very interesting. And for those of you interested, it's Genesis chapter four, verse twenty-two. Uh, it turns out we're told for the first time of the birth of a sister. Up till now, no women, no sisters mentioned, only the sons. But now we talk about a sister. Her name is Naama. Well, wouldn't you be fascinated to hear that she ends up later on marrying a very well-known guy? As a matter of fact, it was a pretty good thing she married him. I always think it's good for women to marry boaters. Right? I explained to my wife before we got married that, you know, you never know when being married to a boater helps. Maybe there'd be a flood, somebody who can run a boat. It's always useful. And fortunately, I prevailed on Susan. Well, uh, Noah prevailed on this girl, Nama, who is a descendant of Cain and the daughter of Lemech. This is really interesting. So Lemech's daughter, Nama, actually becomes Mrs. Noah, Noah's wife. But wait, uncharacteristically, where names do not repeat in Genesis, we find this name Lemech showing up one more time. And sure enough, do you remember the guy who lived, the, the oldest guy who ever lived, Methuselah? He lived um, a total um, of 969 years. Well, before he died, he gave birth to a son. And now we're looking at chapter 5, verse 27. You know what his na son's name was? Lemech, another Lemech. So very interesting. So this Lemech, right, not only no relationship to the other Lamech. The other Lamech was descended from Adam's son Cain. This Lamech is descended from Adam's son Seth. And that Lamech has a daughter called Naama. This Lamech has a son called Noah. And so one Lamech's daughter marries the son of the other Lamech. How interesting. Noah and his wife both have fathers called Lamech. Why? to drive home this point, that one Lamech was focused on mismanaging sexuality, and the other Lamech was focused on economics. Really? How's that? Well, listen to what is said in chapter 5, verse 28. It's fascinating. It says, um, this one will comfort us for our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Lamech blessed his son Noah to become an extremely effective and successful farmer. So much so that ancient Jewish wisdom says that Noah was the first one to invent the plow. And why is the, um, why, what, how does the timing all work? Well, if you do a little bit of Genesis arithmetic, which I'll spare you right now because you can do it yourself as a, a fine winter evening project, uh, it's quite simple to see that Noah is the first person born in Genesis after the death of um, uh, Adam. Adam died at uh, the age of 830, 930 years old. And uh, he, um, uh, when he dies, the next person to be born is Noah. And the idea was that the curse that God put on the ground was going to uh, endure for the, for the lifespan of Adam. Adam dies, the curse is lifted, and Lemech realizes this is now an opportunity to really make the earth produce, which, by the way, is the heart of economics, right? In other words, you only eat 
in a system where people are working the earth and making the earth produce food. And the only way people can do that is if there are other people making those people tractors and shoes and irrigation systems. So that can all work. Yes, that's what an economic system is all about. So we get to eat. And so uh, here we get the principle of the two lemmachs, one signifying sex, one signifying economics, and the two of them come together in their children, uh, Noah and Naamah, who survive the flood and go on to repopulate the earth in what we could think of as God's plan B. Adam was plan A, didn't work, everybody got washed away, and now plan B starts again with Noah, hopefully with sex and money and the relationship between the two of them clearly and carefully understood. All right? That, by the way, that and a whole lot more is laid out in greater detail in my audio program, The Gathering Storm, Decoding the Secrets of Noah. So if um, you'd like that, or if you'd like to get a clearer understanding of the onus and the inspiration and the blueprint for making your ark that'll float you and your family safely through the storms ahead, go to my website at rabbidaniellappin.com. Go to the store, look for The Gathering Storm. It's a two-hour program with a, um, a, a, a study guide along with it. All of that can be instantly downloaded, so there's no reason to delay get to work on it right now but at the very least read about it i hope you will enjoy it i uh, created that to be an immensely practical and useful thing for anybody who is determined to make sure that his family endures the turbulence that society inflicts upon us in these rather perilous times all righty that's it now it's really this is genuinely as far as we go this week so thanks so much for being part of the show thank you for whatever you have been doing to help popularize the show to help promote it to other people who don't yet know about it very very much appreciated and uh, all that is left for me to wish you is a week of good health and prosperity i'm your rabbi rabbi daniel lappin god bless